Well, I think the most important thing to consider, I think about for me, is that um, all the time that I spent doing what I was doing, and I didn't realize that, you know, how much time I was wasting. And it took away from, not for me, because, you know, but it took away from the children. I love my children with all my heart, but um, I don't know. The mess, mess had me in a prison that I didn't even know. Um, I think, you know, I, I did damage my children. Um, and the one I see the most is, is Ray Lynn. And, I, did it, I wanted to do this because I wanted to stop it, you know, and I, I've tried to live my life since I've gotten out of prison um, the way I suppose I should have always lived it before. Um, you know, I can't change what I did, what I've done, or get the time back. Um, but I, you know, my goal now is to help others so they don't have to go through the same thing or somebody else's children don't have to go through what I put my kids through. I know, I know it takes more than just one person. You know, the whole community has to be involved because it is such a, you know, a strong, it's like a, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it because it changed my life, you know, it didn't change it for the better. You know, it just made everything worse. When I was trying to look for something to, you know, fill a void in my, in my soul, I guess, but, I don't know. I'm just glad to be here tonight and, I'm glad that I was able to help Katie, you know, and to make, you know, bring awareness to other people because that's the point, to help somebody else, you know. I just want to first off um, start off by thanking Glennis for being courageous to step out and share her story. I think so many people <coughs> don't stop to pause to honor um, just how Frightening that can be to embrace a world that's not so um, in, embracing to us at times. So thank you for uh, doing that. Um, it's an honor to sit next to you tonight. And I mean that with my heart. Um, one of the key things that I really took away uh, from this evening and, and as a provider in the community is that uh, so many times uh, we want to say not in our own backyard. And we want to try to put a face, a name, a social class, uh, all these things to what an alcoholic or an addict looks like. And um, it, what we really need to take back is to say that it doesn't have all those things. Um, it comes up in any shape, form, class uh, that you can imagine. And um, it's important that, uh, to know that it is happening uh, all over and what does that look like. And so many times when we present, um, or an individual presents is that it's not just the addict or the alcoholic that we need to address, it's an entire family system. And how do we do that? And what resources do we have? And one of the great things that I've learned in this community here in Pottawatomie County is there's multiple people coming to the table to address that. Um, and one of the things as an organization that um, I have seen as, uh, as partners is, you know, we do that with yeah, Heartland Family Services, we do that with Jenny Edmonds, and it's not just one organization. We do that wonderfully with our um, law enforcement. We've come to the table to uh, do different trainings. Um, we have uh, monthly conversations, just so you kind of know what's going on in your community. Uh, there's what we call a, a mental health and substance abuse uh, network that's ran by uh, Beth Morissette, and anybody <laughs> in this community knows her name, and she's done a wonderful job in bringing community resources together to partner, and um, I think that's the village part of it when we look at organizationally, what do we do? Um, and we ask ourselves a question, because so many times I think what uh, my experience has been in working with providers a little bit, or individuals, and my background is, is I worked in substance abuse primarily for about 12 years, women and addictions, and then I kind of switched over into acute care here, but um, is that we want to take the addict or the alcoholic and say, fix them. <laughs> You know, and, and what we forget is the family system, and that includes parents, that includes siblings, that includes children, it includes all these things, because what we've realized is that we're, you know, um, we're functioning dysfunctionally all together, so everybody needs to get well together. And when we have those crises in our communities and we're starting to see enough taking a certain drug or 
a certain behavior and on how do we address that. And um, again, I go back to there's a lot of partnerships going on in this community and we're aware of a lot of different things. But, um, and the second message is really hope. People do get well. You know, when kids do get recovered, the one thing that um, is really big is kids are resilient. And although they may experience a lot of these different things, um, you know, with that exposure to drugs, and they initially have a positive result for methamphetamine in their system, that drug can go out, they can recover, they do get well, they go on to graduate. And I think that's one thing that we saw in Katie's video, Ephraim graduated, you know, there's, there's many different things that we don't talk about too. So, um, and that takes a village. But it is wonderful programs. It's prevention programs. It's educational programs. It's treating the family system. You know, um, and then there's a lot of things that have nothing to do with the organizations that are going on right here in the community, and they're called 12 step programs. And they're nonprofit, they're peer ran, and that's a lot of things that these organizations try to introduce people into to say, um, there's one person that's walked your path already, and that's what kind of Glennis and I think the Lisa, if I remember correctly, is talking about is um, getting back in the community and doing that volunteer work to say, let me share my story with you. Because there's nothing like one other person who's maybe, their stories aren't identical, but I've walked in your shoes and I know what that looks like, and let me um, help you. And that identification. So, um, that's kind of what I took away from some of that pieces too, is that it takes a village no matter how it is and how, and how do we instill that hope that people can change and let that be the message instead of the, um, oh, what's wrong with you? You know, you're, you're, the, you're the moral defect or it's a choice. Why don't you suck it up and buck it up and put your shoes on and get to it? Because here's the deal is what my experience has uh, been is that the drug use is but a symptom. And I'm a nurse by trade, so if somebody comes to me and they have a fever, that's not their problem. But their problem is they probably have some type of bacterial infection or uh, you know something going on that's causing a fever. And as I went into mental health or into behavioral health, there's something that's causing them to use, and usually it's some type of you know traumatic event or something's triggering that use. And we have to get to that, and sometimes that can change that outcome. So. Um, my take. I'm uh, grateful to be here. Thanks for uh, inviting me. I guess um, <clears throat> probably what I want to bring out is with this great story and stuff, I kind of come from the other side of this whole thing where the story was more talking about the kids and the family and stuff like that. I deal with the correctional side of that. I deal with the adults that have been convicted of criminal offenses in the system. Uh, I've been with the department over uh, 30 some years and in that time frame when I started out I had a caseload that was mostly dealing with alcoholics and a few other sundry type of crimes whether they were thefts or whatever else. Over the years I have seen that caseload completely change from being alcohol that is involved to many aspects of different drugs and all the criminal elements that go along with that, the numerous thefts and burglaries and everything else that go along with that that are devastating to a community. I've been uh, privileged to be involved with our department in a program in the last 10 years we started a program in 2000 uh, to deal specifically with meth addiction and drug addiction for adult offenders. Um, it's called a drug court and uh, it deals with very specifically treatment for these adult offenders. It's very strong into treatment. Uh, most of our clients are in treatment for uh, a year or more. Uh, all of them are on probation for two years. They can be on up to five years. So it's from that aspect that I see the devastation that goes on, how devastating this is in their lives. Over the last five to ten years, another part that's been coming in, we're seeing with these adults is a lot of coexisting mental health problems. And so 
it's another aspect that we're trying to get going and trying to bring some treatment into with these adults, trying to get them into some mental health counseling along with their ongoing uh, treatment addiction. Um, it was mentioned earlier, the 12 cent program, uh, believe wholeheartedly and support a thousand percent the 12 step program in the local area. Um, getting people together and supporting each other is the best help I think that any of them can have up and above the initial treatment. It really does help and support them and uh, carries on after the treatment is done. Well, thank you all three and everyone uh, here as well. I guess, okay, I'm Katie. Um, and I guess the first thing I want to do is just give a couple updates in this last week um, to sort of important events that have happened to progress the story already. Um, Lisa Rios delivered her son, Noah, on Friday. So that was very exciting in her life. And Ray Lynn did get into treatment on uh, Monday. So those two things have already, have already changed, um, which I thought was exciting. I guess for me there's been a lot, obviously, doing this project um, and a lot of important things that both of you have mentioned and, and of course Glennis have mentioned. Um, one, of, one of the important questions that I think we still have to consider is um, removing the child from the care of, their, of, of the meth using parent and that was, a big, that was a big issue for me in doing the reporting on this story was when the drug courts get involved, of course, or even if in some counties there aren't necessarily drug courts, but there's still um, that interference and, and how to decide how long the child should be removed. Um, the custody, uh, Glennis, of course, lost custody of her youngest daughter, um, which has been, it was an important factor in this, and I think that that's something we still need to think about. I'm not sure if there is a solution to that. Um, in doing this, I tried, I tried to offer some solutions at the very end there, that sort of public service announcement type of thing, um, where I just talked to you and you saw some phone numbers go across the screen. Um, you know, that was important to me that this that there was that hope aspect to it, but I just feel that there's still so much to be done. Even as we I listened to what you said, I remember so many things that I wish I could have talked about a little bit more. Um, Jean Stevens and I had a great conversation. Okay. <laughs> no, don't worry. You're welcome. Um, when, when we first met, we talked about some of the struggles um, that once you get out of prison, all of those additional struggles we face, um, women might, well, they're most likely not able to find a very great job, but with that whole felony record, um, and not finding a job, not having a lot of money to support themselves, possibly not being able to reconnect with their children, it kind of almost elicits a, another cycle of abuse. Uh, that, was, that was the first part of this, but as I continued to learn more about this issue, and actually Hugh Wilcox here, uh, and I talked this idea that these families will go into this, um, the, your mother, your grandmother, your daughter, and it just sort of progresses, and I thought that we needed to address that. Um, you know, we talked, you talked a little bit about meth, about alcoholism, about all these different things that I would deal with, I guess, in one aspect I picked methamphetamine to focus on specifically because I do think that it has specific differences than other drugs, um, and it is somewhat specific to my community. So, I guess now we can do some questions. As Lyle said earlier, my name is Jeff Trier, and I'm the news editor over at the Non Perel. And I just want to thank you all for coming out tonight. It really means a lot for receiving people active in the community who want to learn more and get more involved in a program like this that touches very close to home, as you can tell. So um, I guess I'll just start uh, with you, Kate. Tell me a little bit, and the crowd as well, a little bit about why you picked this documentary, how you guys started, and, and the process of creating it. Yeah, yeah. So like I, I sort of just mentioned, um, I, I talked. You know, just a, just a lot of things that happened, actually. My mother is a teacher in the school district, uh, and she had told me some stories, some fairly upsetting stories about students in classrooms, uh, and I just wondered what what sorts of things might be causing that, and and I think what happened, I was, this is an interesting story, maybe. Um, I used to work at a, at a storage facility as a receptionist who sold storage units, so I was obviously very busy all of my days. And so during this time where um, 
as you may have understood, I have, a, I have an extra lot of free time in this storage unit, okay? <laughs> so you don't have to do very much. And so I actually did a lot of research. Um, way before I even came to Iowa Watch, before I did this for my class, I did a lot of research about um, math because it came up in conversation. And I just found shocking um, you know, some of the things made into the documentary, you know, these increasing, this increasing rate of meth use in Iowa even after pseudofedrin went over the counter. So there was this immediate drop and then spikes. And um, when I first started looking at this, I suppose it would have been in 2012. So we were sort of in this continual uprise of people using meth, people making meth, people getting into jail for meth. And then, then this other bit of information started to come out that children were having meth in their bodies. So, and, this, and then the, the more interesting little bit about that is that in a lot of these studies, they consider children to be people under the age of 12 instead of under the age of 18 because 13 and up might be choosing to use meth. So all of those things to me were just so astounding that I, I just really felt compelled um, to do this story. And Keith, here's a question for you. Obviously, as you said, you've seen the transition from when you first started with uh, fourth judicial districts from alcoholism and other cases to focusing heavily on drugs. Obviously, meth has been a relatively recent phenomenon, if you will, for, uh, for drug use in this area. Where do you see the future of this going? Uh, there's obviously many questions regarding the DEC and other programs, but where do you, where do you anticipate seeing the status of the state go on uh, meth and families? I don't currently see a trend of drugs going away myself. Uh, we need and continue to need a lot of resources for treatment and ongoing treatment towards this uh, drug, towards the individuals that are embroiled in this, whether it's the individual that's using himself or the whole family as you're pointing out, Katie, there's a, a lot of damage and collateral damage that continues to go on. Um, right now in our program, I only deal with those that are 18 and above, but I can say that in the time that I've dealt with these clients, I've dealt from every aspect of as far as the community, whether it's uh, a race or whether it's a social economic status or whatever else, none of it seems to make any difference. And as some of this you pointed out, Katie, we see a lot of our clients that are coming in talking about being involved or getting introduced to alcohol, drugs, etc anywhere from the age of five to seven to eight to 10 to 15. And to me, that is extremely scary. Um, when somebody that we get into our program at age 18, 19, or 21, it already has 10 or more years in of addiction. Uh, it really, really becomes a hard thing to change uh, everything, everything in their life needs to change and it's really hard for the families I think to understand all the many things that go in and how how this person really has to make this complete change in their life so it, there's a there's a, a long road here to recovery and, it, and it's going to take a long time and as long as there's elements around in the society in this country that are making money off of these drugs, I'm afraid it's going to be around. Okay, uh, yeah, and I guess I just wanted to add to what you were saying and sort of what you both said a little bit earlier. Um, you know, there's absolutely this personal journey of overcoming the addiction, but I think what I wanted to talk about really was everyone else's role in it too. Um, and I, you did a really great job of sort of enunciating that it does take a village, absolutely, but I, I think that part of this is, and maybe one of the things that I took away from a lot of these interviews was there is sort of some, some sort of void that drugs try to fill and there's some sort of 
something that people are trying to overcome. And one of the easiest, also maybe the most challenging things that we can do just every single day is um, be aware of that and try to recognize that people who are suffering around you or maybe acting out or acting in a way you don't like or agree with maybe are going through something and that it might be your role to make this community better. Uh, and that, that was something really important to me. That everyone who pointed out I wanted to reiterate thank you. <laughs> and Haley, along those lines, the idea that it takes a village to help reverse the course and help treat addictions like this, can you talk a little bit about the very real costs of the addictions that you see in your facility on a daily basis? Um, average cost. Okay, addiction is extremely expensive, and I think we see that all the way through our community. Um, it, it, thinking of the judicial system, I think of the average cost for us. Um, we do not have an inpatient residential facility for addiction. What I can tell you is some references to. So the average cost for a 28-day stay, if you will, inpatient can range anywhere from ten thousand to thirty thousand dollars. Um, and, and that alone, but when you look at the cost of addiction on society, um, you know, that range can continue to go and go and go and go and go and go. Um, you know, I was thinking from a, a criminal standpoint, when you start talking about those that have to maybe steal to make sure to get their next fix, and then you have the DUIs, and you have the court costs, and you have those that have to be on, you know, continued probation, and then maybe they have to be on monitoring, and then you have your mental health outpatient, you have your substance abuse, I mean, the costs just change, 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 change the dollars. And, you know, you look at the dollars and the investment, and we look on our end, and this is something we're always going to, is the dollar amounts to invest in people up front when you look at residential, um, inpatient, or you're looking at outpatient, our resources uh, continue to get cut. And I say that with love, um, but the amount of uh, monies are, are just not there anymore. And so when I talk about community partnerships, we continue to come to the table, and I'll tell you, it's a special community out there in Council Bluffs. Um, we say you have this resource, the Heartland Family Services, we have this one at Allegiant Creighton Health. You have this one at Jenny Ann, and this one's over here. So we meet as a community once a month, even, well, probably more than that, to be honest. And we say, how do we, how do we leverage that? And how do we best make that? There's actually one team in this community that, um, that's called the CRT team, in which we cover all these special laws like HIPAA and different things and we get released to sign and we see individuals which we would call high utilizers of services and the patient um, opts to participate in that team and it, they include even the judicial system, all sorts of things. Um, and we try to find out the best place for that because really these are individuals maybe that have burned out all their bridges and we're trying to decrease things like costs to the hospitals, to the residential facilities, to the outpatients, to the court, to all those things to make sure that, that patient, though, is not being forgotten. That although, despite their behaviors and the way they're showing up in society or whatever's going on, that we're looking at the key thing. And a lot of those individuals have, number one, primary substance abuse or primary mental health, and we know, and we see that high risk of, um, and meth is primary. I mean, that addiction in itself, and you, and you really keyed in on something, Katie, as you're talking about um, a drug that really has its own unique set of things. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, but the cost is, um, I don't know if you can put a dollar amount on it, when you really start talking about how addiction's fingers get <coughs> out and start touching, and then you talk about the family and their costs, and it can go on and on and on. So. And Glennis, obviously you do your work volunteering to help hopefully break this cycle for other meth users who can hopefully use that for your family. Can you talk a little about the stories that you see on a day-to-day -day basis doing that of uh, redemption, of struggle, and how, how meth affects people to on, on both sides of it, from the addiction side and the recovery side. It's obviously it's a very long process on for both for both new users and recovering users. And can you please explain a little bit to the crowd about how that process takes place?
Well, I know that from my experience, and I think, I don't know, I, I believe that meth is probably one of the worst uh, drugs that they could have invented because it, you know, destroys you from within, you know, but it has such a strong hold on you that a lot of people don't make it, make it out. Um, um, I've seen family members that, uh, and friends, I guess, that because it, it damages your central nervous system when you're using because, you know, you don't take care of yourself, you don't eat, you don't sleep, that's in your mind, that they've had nerve damage so that they're always twitching or, you know, their mouths are moving or even once they get sober, they still have those little ticks in them. But um, I have to say, some of the, the people that I've been around um, that do, you know, go up and try to stop using, um, it usually takes them more than one time. You know, they go, they stop, they go to treatment, or they get involved in NA or AA to try to help them, you know, stop using. But um, I'd have to say, for a lot of people, it takes at least seven times in a treatment center for, for some people that, you know, before it really catches on. It's, it just gets, I mean, it takes such a hold of you. Um, you know, what Lisa was saying about uh, having God, uh, like, take the, take the wine away, I think, I believe that's what happened with me. You know, because I used every day. I, I shot up every day. I couldn't get out of bed unless I stepped needles in my arm. That was, that was my life for, like, 10 years. And, um, if I would have went to prison, I would have died. So that saved my life, being involved in, in you know. Um, but I never had the craving anymore. Even once I was out, I've been out almost six years. And um, I, I can't say I've been around it, but I, you know, if I wanted to do it, I suppose it would be real easy for me to get, you know, involved with it again. I just, um, I don't know. I just, I'm, I just believe that God, you know, saved me for, do something else with my life and helping others and letting them know because I've been down that road, you know, and I don't know, I, I just, I think sharing what you know and what, so the others, you know, they don't think that, but some, I think some people think you're not going to understand how I feel or, you know, what I've been through. <laughs> um, I like to tell them because, I don't know, I, some people, oh, you don't look like you've used drugs before. But, you know, like I said, that was one of my main things. My purpose was to get high every day. So, you know, thank God that I don't have to go through that anymore. I don't know if that answers your question. Absolutely, thank you. I'd talk a little bit on that. Uh, one of the things that we try to encourage with our program is our clients that are in recovery to try to talk to the new ones that are coming into recovery. And it does give hope to the clients that are coming in. Um, one of the aspects of this drug is a, it's, it is very insidious and it seems that these users continually to make these deals with themselves as they're using that I will do this but I'll never do this and then they find themselves doing that so they say well I'll never do this so at the time that a lot of times they're coming in our program they're extremely low they don't feel uh, really there's much they can do and they have little hope of ever breaking this cycle of addiction so for our clients in our program when they're gone through treatment come back and talk to them and, and let them know that they can change, that there is hope, that they can recover, that they can make it through, can sometimes make the difference for these clients in going through and themselves recovering versus the ones that uh, go back out and return to their use and unfortunately sometimes to the death. Right. Um, there's obviously a lot of questions to be had, but it's time for the audience to ask any of the panelists any questions they may have about the video or their real life uh, things that they see. So, does anybody volunteer right here? Thank you.
You know, my dad was an old Navy man, and he said never volunteer for anything. <laughs> but uh, I work with Keith. He works in the probation office, and I work in the residential facility, so he and I pass a lot of people back and forth. Every once in a while, one of us has to call the other and go, where is he here? <laughs> where is she? And I'd like to address this to Keith, who does this wonderful work, but, you know, a couple of people have brought up, you know, about the generational aspects of this, and Keith has been doing this for 30 years, I've been doing it for 37 years, and um, we see now recently, I'm actually seeing the grandchildren of people go into the facility of people that were there when I started working there back in 1977. And it does get kind of frustrating when you're trying to break that cycle. And um, I think one of the most difficult aspects of this, and I'd like to hear your opinion on this, Keith, it's hard sometimes to separate the treatment aspect from the criminal justice aspect of it, where a person could be an addict and due to his addiction, he goes out and commits some burglaries. So he comes into the facility charged with burglary, okay? But the underlying problem is he's a drug addict. Then he goes out and looks for a job. We talk about that adjustment all potential employers see is thief, you know, or burglar. They, it's hard for them to see that other aspect of it. And I just like, you know, Keith's opinion on how to address that so that they don't have to, when they go out, they're trying to improve themselves, they go out to get a job and they got this black, you know, this big black mark on their record and they don't have the opportunity to explain to a potential employer, well, I stole because of this underlying condition which I have dealt with. And I just maybe hear some comments about how we address that. One of the hardest things that we have uh, in our drug court program the first thing that we try to determine in considering whether or not we want to work with a client or an addict is do we have a drug addict that commits criminal offenses or do we have a criminal who use drugs? And that's a very difficult thing to sort out. A lot of times uh, what we can find out is we are just cleaning up a criminal who can continue on with his criminal life and not have the drug element involved. Um, when it comes to employment, it's again one of these things of partners in the community. And uh, we have in our drug court program at uh, any one time roughly 40 some people. Um, as I said, this program started in 2000, and in that time frame, I've been with it um, since 2002. One of the requirements of our, our program is our clients go to treatment, but also as a part of their treatment, they are required to get a job and to pay the cost of their treatment, to pay the cost of their own livelihood in the community and pay court costs, fines, all those types of things. We have a great number of businesses in this community that knowing this program, knowing working with us, that have a open heart as far as working with their clients. I have clients that have jobs from anywhere from minimum wage up to, I've had clients that are making 20 plus dollars an hour. So the possibilities do exist. I'm not saying they're always easy, but they are there. And there are a lot of businesses that are open to working with the clients and first look at uh, somebody and what they're trying to do 
and give them a chance. Uh, it always amazes me the number of clients that we have that come in and have committed burglaries and thefts, etc., which is a normal part of a drug addict's life. And these businesses take them in and are willing to make them into cashiers or somebody responsible for monies and stuff like that in their businesses. So it, it, it is a possibility, it does exist. It, it, it's more so sometimes with the client and their persistence. Again, it also is with, uh, we have a number of treatment agencies and as the clientele that are clean and straight are out there and they themselves run in businesses, it does help for us to partner with them to be able to get uh, people in the job. But in the last 10, 12 years, that's really never been too much of a problem with the, with the clients that we've had. Question right back here. Um, actually, I have more of a comment than a question. I'm Jean Stevens with HopeNet, and I'm one of the program directors. Um, I just want to share a couple things. Glennis failed to mention that she was um, for time on staff with HopeNet, and she is a wonderful facilitator. So we are grateful for her as well as, I don't know if Donnell is still back there, but Donnell, um, the cute little fellow that was running around, she just graduated from drug court, and Keith had worked with her. So that's really exciting. Uh, we work with women who um, have come out of incarceration and or addiction in Council Bluffs with adult females. But we also do monthly dinners in Council Bluffs for the, the families as well. So they have their children there with them. Um, that being said, I want to share that uh, at least 75% in what I've seen in my research of the women who have addictions have been uh, abused or molested. Um, at some point earlier in their lives, and it's probably a much higher figure than that. But that uh, oftentimes the the fact that they start when they're you know 10, 11, 12, 13 years old is to, to deal with that pain of that abuse. So we're really there needs to be something happening in school or in some community resource um, when the children are younger. Um, the other thing I wanted to share too was that um, you know 12 steps is great, but um, it's not for everybody. We also have a women's winter circle group that meets every Wednesday night. And then there are also other groups in Council Blast called Overcomers or Celebrate Recovery. That's our excellent resources as well. Um, so I don't know, Randy, if the video is still up on the HopeNet website or not. That's our executive director with HopeNet. But we did it for a time. I'm not sure if it's still available. We'll have a video with Glennis uh, interviewed as well on the video. So hopefully you can still pull that up. But, um, that's just one of the things I would share. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for the panel? I don't need a microphone, I don't think. And, and anyone from the panel can answer this question for me because I'm kind of illiterate when it comes to drugs. But it appears that methamphetamines is the end result. And you kind of indicated to you that other things maybe are tried before we get to methamphetamine. I guess my question is, is methamphetamine the start of the drug issue, or is it kind of the end? Do you work your way up from alcohol, marijuana, something else, and finally you get methamphetamine and say, hey, this is the one? I'll take a chance on answering that. I think um, historically we used to see gateway drugs like alcohol, marijuana, and then we used to work up into methamphetamine. And help me out here, Keith. But over the years, I, what we're trending to see is now alcohol, not so much. In teens, we're starting to see marijuana is really big. We're seeing some over-the-counter prescription use drugs. And you'd be surprised at what Muse Next DM can do in um, mass quantities for children. Um, but we're seeing that we're seeing it get stepped up a little bit. So kids aren't so um, scared to walk out and try methamphetamine for the first time. And they're doing it in different forms. Where it used to be, so we got a little alcohol out of mom and dad's cabinet, and then we used to smoke a little marijuana, and then we tried meth when we got a little bit older. And the trend is changing. And so we're seeing that you know methamphetamine we talked about, and like Katie discussed, children and the uh, endangered program, it's now anyone under the age of 12 because children are considered, or a, I shouldn't say. At age 13, they're considered to do that by choice. 
and so preteen that it's offered, it's available. Um, you know, I have a 16 year old son who told me that he can get marijuana quicker than he could ever get alcohol these days, and that methamphetamine is offered to him along with opiates in his own high school in a rural community I live in Iowa. So I think we're just seeing trends change. Things are different. So I think um, different social economic classes uh, somewhat makes a difference on this. Um, I think every story can be different individually. Um, I know when we look at Western Omaha, uh, sometimes we see clients come from there and they may be more used to using uh, heroin or uh, a different drug over there, but uh, prevalent throughout the Midwest, meth seems to be the primary. It seems to be the go-to. Uh, a lot of our clients coming in start out as kids, as we said, getting into alcohol, marijuana, and trying different things in the teen years. But we also have some clients that start out right there with meth, and it seems to be, for most of them, again, that is the drug that gives them the best high, that they get the most bang for their buck, they get the most return out of them. It is, in my mind, the most addictive one that is around. Uh, we see a lot in the news lately about designer drugs, uh, the bath salts and the synthetic marijuanas and everything else. But for the most part, uh, those are sideline people, a lot of times that are using them instead of using meth or something like that, trying to skirt the law. But by and far, uh, I have quite a number of clients that told me the first time they ever tried meth, they knew that they were addicted for life for that. So it, it just ends up being the drug that everybody goes to. What you said about the gateway drug, I started drinking when I was 13, and then I moved to marijuana. And then uh, I tried meth the first time when I was 17, and like I said, that was it. It was, I've tried heroin and, you know, PCP and, L, you know, LSD, and I smoked wet, um, and, you know, I've done everything, you know, but that wasn't my main thing. That was the love of my life. You know, that was it for me. And, um, you know, I, so, but it, it does amaze me that I know that how young, it's, it's younger and younger. And it scares me because they're, you know, their brains are still, you know. And it's going to, it was worse for me, I mean, it was bad for me when I was 17. I really shouldn't have a brain right now because of all the stuff I put in my body. But, you know. I do go to college, and I, I've been on the dean's list, so <laughs> I don't know. I, like I said, I think God was protecting me, but um, I feel for the kids, you know, because they're coming from the homes and they're looking for something my dad was looking for, and you know, they deserve better than that. So. And I can attest to. Um, I currently oversee child adolescent and adult unit in our child adolescent unit. Class our highest rates of reported substance abuse is methamphetamine. And we um, age range from our youngest kid this year um, that was intake was 10 and our oldest kid was 18. I was just trying to review statistics and we do um, uh, gains, what we call gains, we do a substance abuse screening on every child and every that comes into our unit. So. And, and what I would like to add is when, when I, and I'm glad I said I wanted you to mention it because you explained it to me, you know, you and Lisa pretty well told me, but, um, you know, Lisa mentioned, and just like you said, it completely altered everything that happened. So, you know, Lisa mentioned when she was a kid, she would do LC or whatever drug she could really get her hands on, but as soon as, but she could, you know, go to work during the week was one of the things that she told me that, that was 
a real shift in her life was that she, um, you know, she was able to graduate high school. She was able to work a job. She took some community college classes at night, and then this was the first time that she tried meth. Her life was 24/7 altered, and so I think I think to answer your question, there might be some sort of stepping stone, um, but they're looking for something that can't be fulfilled maybe by other drugs, and, and there I think I think what we showed and what the research has shown is that there really aren't other drugs that change brain chemistry to the extent that methamphetamine does. Um, and I, I guess maybe I'm not sure if down the road, you know, we need to put a marker on other drugs. I mean, you know, I mean, certainly we need to keep drugs out of children's hands. Um, but I think one of the things that you mentioned was even now that you've been outside of this world for at least 12 years, um, you could still get it any time you wanted to. And even your son, and, and I remember in high school, I certainly knew who, who had drugs and, um, and who had meth and who had been offered meth and, um, or, you know, I guess they called it ice, and I didn't know what that was until I asked, and then, and then you figure it out. And I think that it is abundantly everywhere. And I, I guess, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe you could speak to this. But how do we, does law enforcement? How do they track that down and try to put their hands on it? Because in my research, um, there's so many ingredients available, and there's even after pseudoephedrine went over the counter, that was a big improvement immediately. Um, people found other ways to create it. There's now these shake and bake methods. You don't have to have a full lab. You can put it in a pop bottle. Um, farm chemicals are largely used. Obviously, we're in Iowa. Uh, we're on the interstate, so we can traffic it. I mean, it just seems like it can come in faster. Meth can come in faster than law enforcement can really touch it. Do you think that's... As I think your video pointed out, the meth labs have changed over the years, and they've fluctuated up and down. Um, but from what I've got out of working very closely with law enforcement, uh, law enforcement is a part of our team on this drug court panel. Um, the, by and large, the bigger share of our methamphetamine and drugs in this community are shifting here. It's not the uh, production itself of meth. There is some of that, there always is, and the programs that they've done, whether it be through the farm chemicals or through the pharmaceuticals as far as trying to limit the access to the drugs, has not cut it off. There's always ways around it. There's always the chemist that is helping somebody else to figure out a way around it or a way to make the math or whatever else. But I think um, the hard part is the continued control of the drugs that continue to come into the community and then uh, those that are in the community that try to make their living by selling these drugs. And it, it's, it's, again, a big part of this. Uh, I think if you talk to law enforcement, uh, they expend a lot of energy and time on that same subject. We're nearing the end. And uh, any last minute questions, comments? Yeah, okay. I don't have the microphone. I speak right. uh, What can, say, like uh, the legislators in Des Moines do to uh, help s stop it from coming into Iowa? Uh, make the penalties for people that, that sell it and distribute it. Uh, what can we do, what can they do there to uh, help stem this disease, because it's a disease? And what can they do to help people get help? We continue to need support financially for treatment uh, for the, as we've just mentioned here, for the extensive damage that this drug does to the individual and to the family system, the family unit in the community. Um, one of the things that we've been doing, the legislative aspect has been doing, has been trying to toughen up the drug laws in the community. Um, some of this is resulting in um, more and more 
clients ending up in prison <coughs> for some of these drug charges. The problem that I see from my side is putting somebody in prison is not going to help them with the drug problem. That the first thing they're going to do when they get out is use. So we continue to need to to address that through the criminal justice system to try to determine what percentage are drug users and to try to continue to push for treatment for them. Well, there's people that sell this stuff that don't use it. Correct. So how do you get those? What do you do with those people? Those are the ones. Those are the ones that need to go under the jail. Those are the ones that you have to. But the problem that you're going to get into, the hard part about that is. I've not had too many clients in 30 some years that use drugs that didn't in some aspect sell, okay? Usually, whether it's the family unit or our friends or whatever else, so I have a little extra, so I give you some, etc. And that's a way of me continuing to be able to have my own drugs. So to really separate out the real user from the real seller is a, it's a very blurred line. It's very hard to do. Yeah, I, I would say that's probably true. I think that there, I think that there's often this sort of perception that there might be um, Breaking Bad type of <laughs> guys, right? I mean, I'm not saying that you're saying that, but right, he was the kind of guy that never actually used it, would sell it. And I think that at least in Iowa, that at least in my research and with the people I've talked to, that hasn't really been the case. As far as what legislator, legislators can do, um, I think that the consensus throughout making this documentary is that one of the big areas where the shortcomings are right now is in um, mental health. And over, I think what we've heard a lot now and, and throughout my research has been that when people use, it's often sort of self-medicating. And I think that a big push lately has been to alter the way that we deal with early childhood mental health. Um, and there's, and as I mentioned in here, and as we talked about a little, was um, the lack of, of people who are trained to deal with children, specifically. Um, very, very limited places throughout the state of Iowa where there are child psychologists, child mental health specialists who can deal with the large number of kids who are dealing with trauma right now. And if, if I could hear, if there could be something like that, I think that filling in that gap with mental health services might be something like one of the things that uh, we did in partnering with the state of Iowa for our program is we did uh, get a federal grant for mental health counseling, a three-year grant for our clients, and uh, that was something that was really needed. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, the ladies that are coming into this program are extremely um, sick, they have a lot of trauma, uh, there's a lot of need for this mental health counseling and at the same time we find more and more as we get some of our male individuals into this counseling finding out that there's been a lot of abuse and trauma that's gone on in their lives. So again, yes, correctly, you're very right, continue to support the the mental health aspects that are going on, that a lot of dual diagnosis that uh, we get into with our clients, mental health and the drug addiction, so along those lines. But all the way around, again, support, as uh, she has said, for the family and the family unit that there's a lot of counseling, there's not a need for the treatment all the way around. I want to conclude uh, with about one minute of some acknowledgments. We promised we'd get you out of here. Uh, first of all, I want to really thank the Legion of Creighton Health, Mental Health Services and Mercy Hospital uh, for uh, sponsoring this. It's been very helpful. Uh, I want to thank Manon Perel and, uh, and John Schreier. Uh, so we called John up a couple months ago and said we want to do this, and he was all for it. This person here who's been typing is Lauren Mills. She is a digital analyst, staff reporter, and assistant editor at Iowa Watch. She has been live blogging this. And so a copy of this live blog will be available at iowawatch.org if you're interested in, 
in going back and seeing seeing what was done. On the table over here, we're a nonprofit, so there's some information if you're interested in knowing about Iowa Watch. There are some stamped envelopes. We do uh, we're funded with fundraisers, uh, uh, foundations, events, and and donors. If you're interested in in the work we're doing, John has his card there. But important is also there are some flyers here that Haley has left uh, for more information. I think it's valuable information. I want to thank uh, Glennis, Haley, Keith, and Katie for coming out on this night. Uh, I want to thank Katie especially for doing such fine work. And I want to thank you for coming and staying with us. This was a really good audience, and, and we hope that uh, you continue the conversation. Sounds like you have a network in place to do that. So I hope we, hope we further the conversation. Thank you for coming. Thank you.